right, I have with me John Danaher, who's the author of Automation um, and Utopia. Managed to get a copy on, as I normally do, on Amazon. Probably not too clear in this, but it's a really, really good book, which I've just finished reading, actually, this past um, weekend. And I think it's, it proposes really an interesting um, idea, because I'd say even in South Africa, the concern or the conversation around automation is that it poses a huge threat to, to livelihoods and, and to work, essentially. Um, and so you tend to see, particularly in policymaking circles, a lot of the conversation focusing on how do we um, protect jobs in the face of automation? And I think you present a novel idea and you say, well, kind of let it, let automation take over work. And in some ways, actually, it's inevitable. Um, so can you introduce us a little bit idea to, um, you know, to, to the scope of that pushback? Yeah, so I mean, as you, as you say, most discussions of automation tend to focus on the you know, negative repercussions of this from, from an economic perspective and, and the loss of livelihood and the loss, loss of income. And so I suppose like one general way of, of framing the, the book that I've written is to say that you know, what, what, what do people get out of work? And you could look at this in kind of two dimensions. You can look at it as they get certain instrumental economic goods out of work. So income is the obvious way of phrasing that. And I'm an academic, so I chose a more complex term for that, but income is what most people think of is what they get from work and income allows them to you know, pay for a lifestyle that is either you know, kind of de decent for them or subsistence for them, whatever the case may be. But then people often talk about other kinds of things that people get out of work, other goods of work, they get some sense of, you know, social contribution and meaning and community and maybe a sense of kind of pride and achievement from work as well. And it seems that if there's widespread automation of work, we, lo we lose both of those things. We're deprived of, of both income and we're deprived of these other goods of work. And so that looks like a bad, bargain or a bad deal. And so the, the question then becomes, is that really true? Are, are we thinking about the, the benefits of work in the right way? Or are we kind of too trapped within a, a worldview which sees work as a thing that is essential to our you know, social and personal well-being and survival? And so the purpose of the book is to kind of push back against the, the assumption that work is necessarily a good thing to suggest that there are, there are ways in which we could actually unlock more goods or more potential by trying to achieve some sort of post-work economy. Yeah. And I mean, maybe to start at the beginning, as you do um, in the book, you say that I think to make the this conversation seem worthwhile, because some might ask, you know, is this really a conversation we need to be um, to be having, how likely is this and how soon are we to realize in such a world? You begin with this idea of human obsolescence and you say that this is actually um, a likelihood. What I enjoy is that you're quite humble actually or you exhibit a great deal of humility about the claims that you are making. So not, a, not necessarily that we're going to be a world that's entirely without work, but that it's important enough or at least enough jobs or enough areas of human activity are under um, threat of non-existence to make this a worthwhile conversation to be having. Can you point out maybe some of the most compelling areas um, for, that provide evidence for human obsolescence? Yeah, I mean, let me say two things about that. Like one is just to kind of follow up on, on the premise of the question you're asking, which is the, the idea that, um, that, you know, the book isn't, when people talk about technological unemployment or automation, sometimes the assumption is this means there's a future in which nobody is working. And that's not really the, the claim that I'm trying to make. Uh, one thing is that we have to be a little bit clearer about what it means to work in the first place. And you know, the danger that people think of work as sort of any physical mental activity that humans do, it, it's all work to some extent. Uh, getting up in the mornings is work and, you know, feeding and clothing your children is work and, um, you know, completing accounts or writing articles for me, that's a kind of work, let's say, as an academic work. Um, so th there's a danger that we have an overly expansive concept or definition of work. And if we do, then the notion that the future could be one in which nobody works doesn't make any sense because people aren't going to stop 
acting in the world or performing uh, physical and mental activities. So I, I tend to adopt a somewhat kind of narrow definition of work, which probably joins up with the more colloquial concept of a job, which is, you know, a thing you do in return for some kind of, of payment. It's a, it's a condition under which you perform activities under the expectation or demand for some kind of economic reward. So when I'm talking about technological unemployment and the auto automation of work, I'm talking about that phenomenon in particular. And that's important, right? Because all those other activities um, in the broad sense of work that might be in common usage might still be possible in the world that we're talking about. It just wouldn't be under the specific condition that that activity is undertaken in the expectation of reward or potential reward. Yeah, exactly, right. And so ma many things that you do now because you get paid for them might, and there's some sort of sense of economic necessity attached to them that you have to do them. They might become optional in the future. You just do them because you think they're they're fun. So you know, yeah. I might I might continue to write academic papers or research academic papers because I think it's fun. You know, to some extent, that is kind of true of my job as it is. I don't I don't really get paid for what I write or what I do. I get get a flat salary that's unconnected to the exact activity that I perform. We can come back to that idea later on. Yeah. And not, you know, say like family life. You know, in some ways, you could argue that. The automation of work will give more opportunity for you to you know, engage with your family and spend time with your family or leisure pursuits that you have, hobbies that you have. You might, again, unlock more time to do those things. Uh, so all those things are still possible in a you know, world of kind of rampant automation. Uh, but like, so if we're talking about that work in that more narrow sense, um, in what kind of future are we envisaging? Well, one thing that's worth bearing in mind is that in many you know, industrialized nations, there's kind of a large percentage of the population that don't work already. You know, there's a statistic that's commonly cited by economists, which is the so-called labor force participation rate, which is the number of adults of working age who are actually employed at any given time. And you know, that figure varies around the world a little bit, but in most industrialized countries, it's around... 60 to 70 percent of the adult population work. Uh, so it's already the case that there's 30 to 40 percent of the adult population that, that don't work. And it used to be higher actually in the past. Uh, it, the labor force participation rate increased in the latter part of the 20th century largely as a result of women entering the, the workforce, uh, that being more normalized. And it started to tick down slightly in countries since then. Um, so, you know, a world in which, let's say, 15 to 30 percent of the adult population work and the rest don't, that will be a world that is, I would say, dramatically different from the world that we currently live in. It's still going to be a large number of people working, but it, it, there'll be a sufficient number of people not working that it will require some kind of radical rethinking of society, the kind of institutional structure of society, what we expect from people, what we envisage as being a good adult life. So, you know, at the moment, particularly in cultures where the so-called you know, work ethic is very strong, you're not really a fully functioning member of the human race unless you're working. You're kind of viewed as yeah. almost like a social pariah or parasite sucking upon the kind of welfare state, let's say, if you're not working. Yeah. Um, but if it's the case that the majority of the population aren't working, that will have to be kind of destigmatized. And, you know, I wrote this book long before COVID-19 hit, well, a couple of years before COVID-19 hit, but in a sense, we've kind of seen a little bit, at least in where I live, the results of a large percentage of the population being unemployed by um, circumstances beyond their control. Uh, so, you know, a huge increase in the number of people who had to, to take state welfare because their jobs were rendered impossible due to lockdowns or public health measures. And there, there had to be kind of a shifting away from the, the tendency to assume that these people are you know, somehow lazy or not socially yes. fit. So, we, yeah. so we're talking specifically about work being um, any activity done for economic reward or the possibility of reward, and particularly envisioning a world where such um, activity reasonably, you know, um, applies to at least the majority of the population. So you're not claiming all but it would be reasonable to say that if this applied to the majority of the population, it would make sense to be discussing this and that it's likely that we could reach such a state. Where yeah, I mean, 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, just to throw in another bit of jargon here, even though this isn't something I really rely upon heavily in the book, there's another way of, th of thinking about this. So in kind of Marxist theory, there's this notion that, um, you know, there's a, there's a percentage of the population that is not necessary for capitalist production. They're not essential to the mechanisms of, uh, mechanisms of capitalist production. Yeah. And that's so, yeah. yeah. It's referred to as the surplus population. So what we're imagining here is a world in which the surplus, surplus population is dramatically increased as a result of automation in the workplace. Yeah. A rather uh, chilling uh, phrase, <laughs> but yes. Yeah, but I guess that's, that's part of, um, kind of the Marxist ideological framework of you know, raising consciousness around this. But yeah, it, it, maybe it's a kind of negative connotations associated with the notion of a, of a surplus population it seems an unnecessary population, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I want you to get into the reasons for why such a universe in which people are not doing work for um, for reward um, could, is possible, you know, why there are reasons to believe that such a scenario where this applies to the majority, where then the surplus population in effect becomes, you know, the majority of the people, the population that we're talking about. And what are these compelling reasons to believe that um, this could be occurring? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, this is the second part of the answer to the question that I was going to give earlier on, but um, because I'm you know, long-winded, I didn't get to that second part. Uh, so, you know, what, what? So, what are the reasons to think that this is possible? That the widespread automation of work is possible? Well, you know, one reason is to kind of look to history and see what's happened in different industries historically and the, the effect of automation on different industries, and it seems pretty clear that a large number of human workers have been displaced by machines in the past. Okay, so the, the classic examples that will be given here would be farming or agriculture and manufacturing industries. You know, in, yeah. in Europe, in the early part of the 1800s, I believe you're talking about over 50% or is it 50 to 80% of the population are engaged in agriculture, agricultural labor of some kind. Um, probably not that high in countries where the industrial revolution has really taken off. But now, you know, fast forward 200 years, you're talking about less than 5%, in some cases, less than 2% of the population are employed in agriculture, directly employed. Uh, so there's been a, you know, a sea change in that particular industry as, as a result of mechanization and automation. Uh, same is true in, in manufacturing industries. It's a more kind of recent phenomenon where the large number of people employed in manufacturing throughout the 20th century they have seen a lot of their jobs displaced by machines or, or dramatically altered or changed the nature of their work as a result of, of machines. Um, and so the, you know, the shift in most kind of industrial countries is towards a service or, um, or post-industrial countries towards a service-based economy as opposed to a, a manufacturing-based economy. And that's, where, that's what's sucking up human labor now or absorbing, sorry, human labor now. Uh, so you, if you look to history, you see some dis automated displacement in these industries, but the, you know, the counter argument or objection to that will be, okay, we see that happening in discrete areas of the economy, but it hasn't happened across the whole economy. On the contrary, what's happened is that machines have displaced some kinds of work that humans do, some kinds of tasks that humans perform, but humans have just shifted over to some other set of tasks that are deemed economically viable. So they found other forms of employment. It's true that some people were very badly affected by automation in agriculture and manufacturing. Maybe there's certain generations of people that lost their jobs, never found employment again, but subsequent generations have recovered and um, have found other forms of work. So in economic theory, the distinction here is between what we call like frictional unemployment and short-term friction created by some sort of disruption in the economy, creative destruction, whatever you want to call it, and then kind of longer term structural unemployment and so more sustained unemployment due to, due to this kind of paradigm shift in the economy. And we don't see that longer term structural unemployment historically. So you know, what, what's happened in the last decade or so is that with the rise of AI and robotics, people are claiming, well, this time it's different. We're seeing automation now increasingly in service sector, in, um, you know, knowledge workers is an automation of some, at least some kind of cognitive tasks that human workers would, would traditionally perform. And the claim is that this latest wave, this latest technological revolution is distinct from the previous ones in that it, it has the potential 
to result in a much wider spread structural unemployment that doesn't isn't just narrowly confined to a particular industry. And one of the claims here is that you know, AI and robotics is a general purpose technology that has multiple uses, it's not confined to just one particular use case. So it has much more disruptive potential. And so that's one reason to think that this latest wave of automation is distinct from historical ones. Yeah. And, and why are you unconvinced that, I mean, I know you talked about it in the book, but just want you to kind of explore that a bit more is why are you unconvinced that retraining and reskilling might help to erase that tight so we can adapt to um, the new technologies because new jobs will be created um, by these new technologies. And if we just do a good enough job of educating people in line with um, new technology, then we will be able to keep people in employment. Well, so that argument goes. Yeah, I mean, so the, again, this is a very popular argument. I just mentioned like the World Economic Forum have released these reports about automation where they've persi persistently made that claim. And I won't remember the exact figures, although some of them are quoted in my book, but something like, you know, 90 million jobs will be displaced by automation, but we will create 110 million or 120. So it'll, it'll actually more than compensate for it. And, you know, that, again, I have some degree of intellectual humility here that, that maybe that's true. Maybe there's something that I'm not seeing that um, we will see a massive increase in employment as people, as people adjust and find new kind of possibilities within the economy. But you know, some of the reasons why I'm, I'm not convinced, I, I, mean, I, I kind of outline a big four of them in the, in the book, but um, maybe two kind of main ones. One is the pace of change and the pace of development is, is one thing to bear in mind here. Um, and you know, for better or worse, it takes a relatively long time to train and reskill human beings. You know, and it's actually it's taking an increasingly longer time uh, than it used to. So again, in, in kind of knowledge economies, most people don't really enter the workforce proper until their late 20s, kind of mid to late 20s. They might have been part-time employment and so forth before that, but you know, they don't kind of enter their the career phase of their life until late 20s and 30s. Um, you know, particularly people who go through like graduate school training, they, they don't come out until they're nearly 30. So it's, it's taking basically 30 years to train a, a human worker to enter their, their career. And it, it could be the case, and there has been some evidence of this in the recent past, that the improvements in AI and robotics are outpacing that. So it's okay. It, it, at, at present, the technology is such that it might be able to replace, let's say, human um, workers in call centers, it might be able to replace some workers in warehouses, it can replace a certain amount of the work done by traders on, on Wall Street or other financial markets, maybe some kind of diagnostics work done by doctors, but it's not replacing everything. So the current state of technology looks like there's still opportunities for humans, but we're, we're kind of seeing these constant iterations of improvement within the technology where it's expanding its reach and kind of overtaking human capacity at a faster rate. And so we have these kind of two time curves or two, uh, two trend lines, you know, the, the, the pace at which AI is getting better at more things and the pace at which humans are being retrained and reskilled. And one of the claims I have is that maybe those um, two lines are gonna cross each other where the, the pace of AI development is gonna cross in human capacity to be retrained and reskilled, which seems relatively fixed and slower. So that's one argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, another argument which um, I think is perhaps not stronger, but I, I find also compelling, which you actually also make um, in the book, is that those complementary jobs that are being created by new technologies are themselves susceptible to, to automation. So even if new um, jobs get created, there's a great possibility that technologies will arise that are competent at doing those complementary jobs. Um, and of course, if we view this as desirable, a world with no work, then you'd probably want then those complementary or new jobs to also be conducted by, um, you know, by various technologies. But one point, so even though I'm sympathetic to, to the various arguments um, um, in favor or on this point, one, one area where I suspect it might be a little weak is surely actually the fact that automation outpaces the ability of human beings to create appropriate educational systems and to retrain and reskill, surely the very fact that automation outpaces this means that there will always be a kind of demand um, for these new jobs and areas. As we see today, where scarce skills 
usually lie um, in sort of these frontier um, jobs and or tasks, um, which we are still developing either the curricula or maybe the curricula has been developed, but we are still training enough people to actually fulfill the demand. So it's almost as though it's precisely because automation outpaces our ability to rehire and reskill, that there's constantly a, a demand for new areas um, of work that we are yet to become competent in. And that actually those jobs will always, um, um, ex I mean, the, the one threat potentially to those jobs is just how long they last. So of course, I agree with you that if technology creates a new job and before we are able to retrain and reskill, that job then becomes obsolete, then of course, we will almost always be kind of chasing a shadow. But if it's the case that automation creates new jobs, which remain in existence long enough for us to catch up with the need to fulfill that job, then there'll always be these jobs at various stages of their kind of life cycle, um, which we are continuously trying to uh, train up a new cohort of people to fulfill, you know, um, computer programmers, um, actuaries, these jobs at some point were new and in demand. And at some point we'll fulfill them and there'll be new jobs to fulfill. And as long as they don't become obsolete in time for us to have retrained people, then that's fine if automation outpaces our ability. Yeah, so I mean, it's certainly gonna be true that there are a set of, let's say, technology complementary skills that you know, people who have the training or capacity to perform them will be in high demand within the economy when you're going through these kinds of disruptive phases. And they might well be able to earn a, a wage premium over everyone else because there's a, a scarcity of labor in that sector of the economy. Um, I mean, like there's, there's a couple of things to say about that. One is, again, I, I do have some skepticism about the capacity for just like very large scale shifts in the educational institutions to, to meet that demand. I mean, it's like, and this might be a product of my sort of narrow thinking within in, in, within universities, which is that it's where I work. Which universities aren't very adaptive organizations, in my opinion. They, they can do things the way they've always done them for centuries at a time. I think that's pretty good. But it may be that there's other kinds of educational industries or spaces that are opening up, like for you know, certificate training online or something like that and, and you know these code camps that they have for people who want to learn how to computer coding in a very short space of time they might be a kind of new innovation in education that is developing the capacity to, to train people into those industries and maybe they have the potential to kind of match um the the training of humans with the skills demand that's out there but I mean, the, the other cause for concern is an argument I get into in the book as well, is that um, some of these industries or some of the new industries that are, might be created by um, machine or by technology, there might be like fewer employable opportunities within those industries. Um, so yeah, this is a, kind of one idea that the, the digital globalized economy has kind of created a what people refer to as a superstar economy where you know relatively few number of players or organizations who employ relatively few people can capture an awful lot of the value within these new markets that have opened up uh, you know a lot of technology companies um and, and this there's one major exception to this which i'll comment on in recent times but it, it, it has generally been true that like okay Google and the internet has created a whole new world of online advertising, but Google essentially absorbs a huge amount of the value, let's say, in online advertising due to their kind of monopoly status within that economy. And Google employ relatively few people when compared to, let's say, their major comparators in the 20th century, like the main you know, car manufacturers in the 20th century would have employed orders of magnitude more people than, than Google. And the main exception to this, by the way, is Amazon. Um, which has gone from being a company which is quite small half a decade ago uh, to a company that's now actually quite large and employs a very large number of people. I think uh, the latest figure is like over, over a million people are employed by Amazon. But it's worth noting that the majority of those employees in Amazon are short time, are kind of casual labor or temporary labor 
used at certain times of year within their fulfillment centers or their delivery network to meet demand, um, often employed under not great uh, conditions. And that's, that's another feature of the argument in the book, which is that even when technology is creating new job opportunities, these job opportunities are worse. They're more precarious, more uh, less, kind of less good benefits associated with them um, than used to be the case. So th those are kind of some, yeah. some concerns that I would have about that. Yeah, I mean, well, I suppose we'll also explore we're, what we're trying to do now is really look at why this might be possible, why there's a strong case to believe that a world without work is possible. Some might say even stronger, inevitable than just possible. But obviously, I'd want to get into, um, you know, a little bit later is is why work is in and of itself um, per se bad. Um, so I don't want to preempt maybe some of the, I have a question on that as well. I mean, on this latter point about the nature of work um, currently and also the nature of work that these new technologies give rise to. But I think maybe that question that I have fits a little bit better with when we enter that discussion about a wild world without work is not desirable. Uh, we can move to that now, unless there's perhaps any other points you think are worth um, us remembering or, or keeping in mind when we're thinking of the compelling reasons to believe that a world without work is possible or even inevitable. Yeah, so, I mean, one thing I would say is that I do use the term possible in the book deliberately because I, I don't want to sort of feed into a, a technological determinist view where that, you know, yeah. uh, technology has this life or agency that is completely beyond human control and these developments are inevitable. I think there is some role for you know, human institutions, policymakers, individuals to change the shape of, of the future. So that's why I say it's possible as opposed to, to inevitable. Although I do think it's probably hard to completely reverse certain trends um, in, in technology. Uh, so that, that would just be one thing that I would um, bear in mind here. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that appears to me um, a relatively one of your, the strong points that you make is that even where you have regulations or policies that might arrest um, technological innovation or us marching towards the direction of a world without work, those interventions are usually short-lived. And that at the end of the day, if the innovation is something that humans find useful, um, it's probably going to be difficult to arrest it, even if we try and, um, you know, a kind of determined fashion implement policies and regulations to arrest that development. Yeah, I mean, that seems to have been true historically that regulation has very rarely succeeded in banning a technology if that technology has some use. And one of the famous illustrations that I use in the book is like the early version of the the knitting loom, kind of tech, the kind of textile automation. Uh, I can't remember the name of the person who created it now, but the, he brought the invention to Queen Elizabeth I in the kind of late 1500s, and she didn't want to support it because she was worried about the displacement of all these human workers. So he brought it to France, and it was developed in France, and then eventually fed back into England and was one of the key technologies in the, you know, what we call the Industrial Revolution. So essentially, you think, you know, the opportunity for policy arbitrage, in a sense, will always, in a way, be available. So even if, you know, well, it's, at least it's one of the ways in which it is difficult to make sure that policy is arrested, because if it doesn't apply in one jurisdiction, it very likely might take root elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, let's take one concrete example of this, which is, um, you know, a proposal a few years ago from, I think, Bill Gates, actually, you may have said it in, in some talk about it, having a robot tax. Now, I mean, he was talking about this more in a sense, which we might get back to, where you compensate, you have some revenue raising mechanism to compensate people for the loss of jobs through automation. There's a number of people who commented on this idea over the years. So there'd be a tax on em employers or companies reusing robots instead of human workers. And that this is this is what might be a way of slowing down automation because you're creating a, a cost, a disincentive to use automated yeah. labor. Uh, okay, okay, that sounds like a it, it could work to slow the pace of automation in principle. It, it works, but I mean, unless you have some kind of global coordination on a, a robot tax, and you also have uh, kind of a a prevention of the globalized distribution network that we have in our supply chains that we have now, there will always be this possibility for you know, regulatory arbitrage. 
and, and we do, we already see countries competing for yes. technology related investment and technology related labor. So, or, so you know, it doesn't seem um, implausible to me to, to suggest that uh, it, it's likely that companies will find opportunities in other jurisdictions if if there's a clamping down in some other in certain kind of countries. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we've said enough, or rather you've said enough around, you know, possibility of a world of artwork um, to convince that it's at least something that we should be considering. So, you know, I think it's, it's helped by the fact that you're not making an, something as absolute as saying, you know, it's inevitable or that it will be a world with 0% work. Um, there is enough um, reasonable consideration of, you know, alternatives to say, well, you know, there might still be work, um, but enough change in the way that society or our labor market is currently shaped to warrant this as a serious discussion about what a world would look like and whether we should be trying to arrest that progress or in fact hasten it. So I want to now maybe look at the reasons for why work is not um, particularly desirable. So we've kind of spoken a, a great deal so far about you know, world without work and why that's um, a possibility. But why beyond a possibility should this be something that we actually desire? Right, so it just kind of goes back to my original framing of the discussion here, which is you know, what, what do we actually get out of work? We get income, we get money that we can use to pay for goods and services that might make our lives go better. And then we also get certain kinds of what I call meaning related goods. So this sense of social contribution achievement, community and um, purpose in, in life. And so I, I think like for a long time, we, we've assumed that work is a, is maybe the only place that we can get these things from these, these goods, uh, the, these um, benefits. Uh, but I think that might be a result of uh, kind of being trapped within a certain ideological worldview, which sees uh, work as somehow part of being a virtuous person or, a, you know, a, a proper citizen within a country, which has been prevalent for a very long time. And then it's possible to try and transcend that and see other ways in which we can access the goods of, that we associate with work in a sort of non-work economy. Now, I mean, income is the obvious one here, and this is the one that I don't really discuss very much in the book, um, which is, okay, how are you gonna compensate people for the, the loss of income from, from uh, automation? And you know, there are many proposals as to how you would address that over the year. The, the aforementioned robot tax is, is one way that you raise revenue that is then distributed to people in some form. Uh, the basic income guarantee is probably the most commonly discussed a solution to the problem of automation, whereby you just guarantee every citizen within a given jurisdiction or state a certain baseline income. Uh, there's a variety of ways of implementing that in practice. You know, it could actually be a, a grant of income that's given to people. Um, everyone gets a check for you know ten thousand um, dollars or whatever it is a year. So I mentioned that example because, as far as I recall, that was Andrew Yang who ran briefly for the Democratic nomination in the US uh, for president and also I think is currently running to be the mayor of New York. That was one of his kind of central policy platforms was a, a $10,000 a year basic income guarantee for all US citizens. There's been a, a defeated referendum proposal in Switzerland, which was a more generous um, basic income guarantee. I think it was worked out at around 30,000 euro per annum for all citizens. And then Finland have run experiments on this and other countries have run experiments on it. So that's one way of doing it. You can also do it through something called a negative income tax, which sounds very odd, but it, it just basically means that if your income falls below a certain level every year, you get paid money by the government instead of being pay, be, paying money back to the government. So again, if I functionally, like for the individual, it, it works in the same way. They end up getting 10,000 a year, but from an administrative perspective, it works slightly differently in that anyone who earns over that 10,000 would have to pay taxes. So they wouldn't necessarily get um, an additional 10 grand, which they, they so might get. This which, yeah, so it's a world in which you could still earn um, 
a reward for in exchange for work. But it's just, I think it turns the key idea here is the voluntariness of it, that at the moment, work essentially, in, in many ways, it's not voluntary. You need to work or you need to get an income in order to survive, um, et cetera. But this is a world in which if you did work for a reward, it would be because you wanted to, not because you had to. Yeah, and so, I mean, that's one of the key arguments that I have in the book as well as to why I think the automation of work is desirable is that I think there are all these kind of bad things associated with work. And so the, the lack of voluntariness is, is one key aspect here, which is that you know, most people don't choose to work for a living. Most people have to work for a living. And that's true even in countries with relatively generous welfare systems. Um, so I live in Ireland, I guess by kind of international standards, we have a pretty generous welfare system, but it's a conditional welfare system in the sense that, you know, if you are able to work, you should be working and yes. you will kind of be investigated or there'll be inquiries conducted into whether you are actually actively seeking work or not. Yeah. And that'll be, that'll depend, that'll determine whether you actually get your, your payment or not. Right? Yeah. And some I countries mean, are much worse me, than that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me personally, the voluntary um, or the, the lack of voluntariness of work is for me, I think, almost the sufficient um, argument in the sense that you don't really need the other reasons to make a compelling case for why work is structurally bad, because the very point that it's um, at least not, in, I think most people would be consent. I mean, you can't just say, I don't want to work and then expect you wouldn't survive. So it's, it's very much um, a coerced relationship. It's perhaps the most important because the other reasons that make work structurally bad, which you list in your book and which I want to give you an opportunity to kind of just go through, wouldn't matter so much if it was voluntary. So, so what if it, you know, if it, if all of those other things are a result of work, if you have a choice whether or not to engage in this relationship, then any bad consequence um, has been consented to. So I would I would think in a way that voluntary or the lack of, of, of voluntariness of work is the key structural bad upon which the others rest. Yeah, so I think the pushback you would get on that argument, and that's an argument that several people have made over the years as another philosopher who I don't actually, I don't discuss much in the book, but I have in, in another work that I've done, Julia on the Skivker has written a book about you know, the badness of work. And that's sort of her main argument, just that it, it's, it undermines your freedom and your choice. Uh, so that's the, that, that tends to be the central platform of a lot of, of, of anti-work arguments. So the one kind of pushback you will get against that, however, is that, um, so even if work in general is non-voluntary, a lot of people will talk about, well, you still have choices between work and you can have, have so there's some voluntariness associated with work or some volition associated with work. And some people don't have to work for a living, but they, they do work anyway and, um, are their jobs kind of uh, good as just because they are they have chosen to work and so i kind of wanted to offer a more general argument that there it's not there's not just this one dimension of of badness to work there is a series of issues with work but but some of them are certainly interrelated or connected to the lack of volition as well and i mentioned that in the book that i think the the other reasons for thinking work is bad tend to kind of compound on top of the lack of voluntariness um, to make it an overarching case for, for work being being a, a very bad thing. Um, yeah. So, so we, we can we can briefly mention through. those other reasons yeah. if you want to. Um, so uh, so yeah, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head here. It's, you got to bear in mind it's been you know, three years since I kind of last uh, wrote, wrote wrote this book. But I haven't talked about it since. But so one, so one issue is um, has to do with the kind of the fissuring of the workplace as a result of technology and the increasing precariousness of work. So it's a phenomenon yeah. that we observe in the latter part of the 20th century, where more and more people are not employed kind of centrally on long-term contracts by companies, but instead on kind of series of, of short-term outsourced contracts. And they're responsible for um, securing more of the conditions of their own labor, like their own health insurance, their own um, accident insurance, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and so that's that's one concern with uh, work. Another concern. And if I can just um, you know, just stop you there, as I think yeah, it's sure. a good point to to um, to raise this this question I had on on precariousness um, as a way of arguing why work is structurally bad. Is that ironically, for those who are proponents of a world without work, is it not the case that the 
you know, what makes work structurally bad, if you say precariousness makes work structurally bad, if you are then to actually try and make work less precarious, you are then entrenching work. So for example, a lot of the things that, you know, if you care about workers, you might want to argue for is that their work should be, you know, is to protect workers, to find mechanisms uh, through policy, particularly that help people that preserve jobs, A, eh, and also make those jobs more secure um, and less precarious. But in so doing, does that not actually then not arrest, but certainly slow down that march to a world without work. So on one end, you have this ideal of a world without work. And on the other, you're trying to um, entrench work and, and preserve work. And how do you almost get around that conundrum? Yeah, so I don't think that is a problem for the view that I'm defending in the book. Uh, I do think it's a problem for another kind of view, which is the kind of, the, there's a, a prominent strand within the labor movement, which talks very much about, you know, dignified work or um, yeah, decent, work. decent work. So you know, decent pay, decent conditions, that kind of thing. So if, if, if your push is towards to make work more kind of secure and sustainable, uh, that and you want dignified work or the, the right to work for everyone, the right to meaningful work, um, then you would be entrenching work by reducing its precarity. Uh, and um, again, this was my my concern would be that uh, there's a there's kind of a, a more radical alternative that's possible. I, I mean, there's the whole kind of movement as well, the accelerationist movement in, in left wing thought, which is this notion that we we should try and like speed up the all the bad things that are happening because that'll lead us to some revolutionary point where we would be able to realize this kind of more kind of po post work economy. So you know the precariousness of employment that we're seeing as a result of like platform capitalism with Uber and these kinds of companies, uh, we should welcome that to some extent because it's hastening the crisis. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see that as being an inconsistent position, but I think like if you were trying but to maybe maintain- then, Maybe let's park that because I think it then leads us to what you're pointing out is that, well, maybe it matters depending on how you want to get there. Um, so, of course, if you want to um, protect workers and this decent work kind of movement, that might, in fact, entrench work and take us longer to get to a world without work. So maybe we should, I just wanted to point out that there yeah. does exist, this, this tension does exist. Maybe it's not a tension that exists in your particular um, vision of how we should get there. But for many, even if they were convinced of the desirability of a world without work, would be concerned about the immediate moment. So even if a world without work is 10, 20 years away, um, what should we be fighting for today and tomorrow? What are the kind of policies we should be putting in place today and tomorrow? And how do you best protect the population, which at the moment are mostly workers? How do you, how do you think about that transition from a world where work is ubiquitous to a world without work? And I think that's going to be, and anyways, and I think this is where then the kind of theories you're starting to touch on around, well, we should accelerate it and perhaps there are other theories and, and maybe we can get into that just in a sec, but I just want us to continue going through some of the other reasons why work is structurally bad. So that's kind of the precariousness argument, but um, I know there are, there are others. For example, you, you talk about distributive injustice. Yeah, so I mean, the question you've asked you about the community consistency is is an interesting one, and there I just there was one other thought that I wanted to mention on that, which is um, that uh, it doesn't strike me as being inconsistent or co incoherent to believe that um, it's it's possible to make work better, like more secure, more stable form of employment, and yet kind of remove, let's say, the non voluntariness of work. It seems like you could have a world in which if you choose to work, you get very good paying conditions, but you don't have any kind of obligation to work. So there's a possibility there of, yeah. of rendering some of those positions. Contradictory, okay. but perhaps intention, um, perhaps there's a tension because if you want to make work better, I'm suggesting that you entrench work. Whereas if somebody's idealistic yeah, and okay. wants to hasten in a world with artwork, you might arrive at that point later if the current work you're doing is focused around 
preserving one a preserving jobs so particularly people who are kind of in the unionist movement usually um, reject retrenchments and any sort of and you know actions by companies or even legislation that might reduce the number of jobs so a they're in the business of ensuring there are as many jobs as possible and b um trying to make sure that the 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 nature of those jobs is not um sort of you know trying to show that in those jobs um, there's as much work as possible. So they're also against underemployment. So not only do they want as many jobs as possible, they want those jobs to be, you know, sort of full-time work that I think then tends to dominate a lot of your life, makes you less flexible. So the kind of things, the kind of work they're pushing for very much entrenches work in our lives, which I think would slow down the progress towards um, a world without work. Yeah, I, I suppose, my, uh, yeah, my point is that I, th I think there are two distinct kind of strands you see within kind of the, broadly speaking, the left, where you have the kind of pro-work left uh, and the kind of anti-work left. And so there may be some tension between them. And, but I mean, just to say as well, that the, 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 there can be some unintended consequence of these pro-work policies about making work better, which is that they can often themselves hasten other kinds of displacement because, you know, you might, you might have very good unionized jobs, but that incentivizes employers to find ways around employing unionized workers or uh, encourages them to outsource work or, or whatever the yeah. case may be. So yeah, anyway. But I think it's important to recognize that whether you're pro-work or anti-work, you could still, um, at least today, you could be anti-work in, the, in the, the current institutional framework in which work exists. So both those who are pro-work and anti-work today could still ultimately design a future or a world without work. But the consequences of the position they take today, I'm just saying, could affect how fast or slowly we get there. Yeah, and it's the same kind of tension that you see within that like, policy for the robot tax, let's say, which is that you know, one of the motivations behind it might be to compensate people who've lost work as a result of automation, but one of the effects of the policy is to actually slow down the pace of automation. So it, it has a yeah. sort of dual um, impact. I mean, so the other reasons uh, to dislike work, one, so one is this kind of distributive injustice problem. Um, and I, I suppose I discussed that mainly in the book in terms of income and you know, I'm not uh, inventing any new kind of territory there. I wrote this at a time when you know, Thomas Piketty's work was very much um, you know, widely discussed. So I, I was relying a lot on his statistics and information about income distribution and the way that that has altered in the past. So 30 to 40 years. And a part of that does seem to be driven by auto, uh, kind of technology. So I, it's kind of relates to the point that you were making earlier on about you know, people who have technology complementary skills can earn a premium or an increased income yeah. at the moment because their kind of employment is in demand and they can maximize the potential from uh, technology. So uh, David Alter is an MIT-based economist has written a bit about this about the polarization in the workforce, that computerization in the workforce essentially eliminated what we call you know, middle income, middle skill jobs, like a lot of clerical work and office work has been completely decimated by computerization in, in the workforce. And that's kind of left people in two distinct poles, which he calls manual work, where you have to perform some kind of um, non-routine physical activity in an unpredictable environment. And then what he, I think he calls creative work, um, which is sort of like problem solving, high intellectual cognitive capacity work. And there are a lot of people who've been displaced into manual work as a result of automation and relatively fewer people have been displaced into this kind of high end creative work. And the people in the high end creative work are earning a lot more money than the people in the lower end kind of manual work. And you can and see, a, yeah. Yeah. And you can see those figures reflected point. in the case. Yeah, and I think that's no. I'm just saying. I think that's that's a, that's an important point around distributive injustice because many might be inclined to say, "Well, so what? You know, if you work hard or train in the right skills, then you can work in this sort of high echelon of skills, which are then valued in um, a knowledge-driven or technology-led economy." But I think the point that you make quite well is that um, it's actually not really a matter of being skilled or not, since there are this middle sort of group of people who who had skills mostly in routine work who are being pushed into more manual work out of no fault of their own. It's not like they were lazy or they didn't study or whatever, but the particular kind of job that they were doing is more susceptible to automation. And so 
forced into either obviously unemployment or seeking more manual and low paid work. Um, and I think the other really um, important point to keep in mind as well, or, or point that you raise is around even the incomes of those higher earning group of people. So A, there's probably less um, of those kinds of jobs. So even if technology is creating these sort of these abstract jobs, which are still valued in the knowledge driven economy, there's probably less of them. So not everyone can actually move into this type of job. But secondly, I really think an argument that many people who are sort of, who believe in a market led economy, kind of moderate liberals, I'm not talking about sort of, you know, really right wing or conservative types, but even people who are, you know, um, relatively on the center, but believe in a market led economy with um, some, you know, so regulations and social welfare would still think that it's it's desirable for people to to earn more in those in those in those jobs because they'd say, well, they worked hard, or it's only fair the person who has the idea or invents some kind of technology reaps the reward of their idea and of the risks they took. But I think an important point that that argument often neglects is that actually it's not distributed proportionately. So the rewards that they accrue are often disproportionate to the contribution to the merit or to the efforts that that person put in. Um, and I think that's something that's worth thinking about is how do you calculate you know, um, the, 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 the relevant reward that should accrue based on the level of risk that you took? Because I'm quite, even though I'm a proponent of market-led economies, et cetera, I, I really do think that there's a strong argument to be made that yes, people should be able to be rewarded for their ideas and merit and hard work, but that many people are being rewarded disproportionately for, for that. Um, and many people are disproportionately not being rewarded for their contributions that they make. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, I mean, it's very hard though to work out what is a proportionate reward yeah. I and mean, this is a large conversation about that. But I mean, it does seem intuitively to me that I, I'm pretty confident that Jeff Bezos is a pretty intelligent guy and very, you know, deserves something for of course. what he created. But whether it's $200 billion of personal wealth is, I think, uh, a, a different question, particularly when you have, you know, workers within his uh, kind of fulfillment centers or warehouses who are um, kind of only employed on a short term basis and um, often have to rely on government support to kind of get through the year. Um, now, I mean, I don't want to get into a long debate about, about Amazon or whatever, because uh, yeah. they've raised incomes as well, or they raise wages and just positive things that they're doing. But just, I mean, just even to dwell on the example for a moment, to go, to go back to this polarization effect, you see that polarization effect directly in the distribution of Amazon's workforce, which is that, you know, there's, there's relatively few people employed, you know, in their main center in, in Seattle, their, their original headquarters in, in, in Seattle in these kind of high-end creative work. But there's a, hundreds of thousands of people employed in what we would call the, the manual work in the delivery system and in the, uh, in the warehouse system. Yeah, and also some of the um, perhaps convincing statistics in, in, in the way of this argument is how the, how the gap between those who are high earners has increased. So, I mean, you include this in your book as well, how perhaps just a number of decades ago, the CEO or um, the top 10% to 1% might earn, um, you know, let's say a multiple of two of the average worker. Um, and just a few decades later, they're now earning, you know, a multiple of 10 of what the average worker. And so the point is, should that multiple be limitless or, you know, so I think, in, in other words, I think just very briefly, because I think, yeah, there's no point going too down this um, this particular avenue, is just to say that it's worth thinking about, um, you know, that we agree that um, people who take risks and work hard, et cetera, can be compensated more for those particular efforts and ideas, but that it's not necessarily clear um, that that reward should be infinite. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a, a fair summary of it. Yeah. I mean, if, if you uh, want to br briefly go back to the other two reasons why I think work is a bad thing. Yes. Um, one of them, which I guess is kind of related to, to the comments about the lack of volition or voluntariness of work as well, which is that I think that work, uh, the phrase I use in the book is that it's, it's colonizing more of our lives in the sense that we spend more of our time kind of training for work, being educated to enter the workforce. Uh, we, um, it's not necessary that we spend more time at work 
but we spend more time thinking about ourselves as workers. And again, this is a very common motif on, on the left that where they talk about the effect of neoliberalism is that everyone has to think of themselves as kind of an, an individual entrepreneur that you're always training yourselves, yourself and increasing your employability and seeking out opportunities for employment. And you, ha you have to let that kind of filter into all aspects of your life. And so th there's very little time for leisure or recovery. You know, there's always, you should really be spending that time you know, upskilling yourself or um, generating other opportunities for employment. And that's compounded by the increased competitiveness and precariousness of work is that you're kind of forced yeah. to constantly compete for employment opportunities. Yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, that, um, that the colonizing aspects of work or the freedom undermining arguments um, um, about why work is bad, I think should be a bipartisan position. It's something that should convince people on the left. And I would say even on the right, if by right, we mean people who tend to be more sort of maybe, um, you know, um, individualistic minded and saying that, you know, we have to protect individual autonomy, which I would say maybe um, the spectrum of left and right looks a bit different. Um, but certainly in South Africa, you might be talking about people who fall more on the libertarian side of the spectrum. But I think it's a deeply, it's a freedom issue. And I think it should convince um, um, everyone. Um, I think it's, it's not hard to look at the ways in which if you think of the number of hours in a day, how much of your hours in a day is dictated by your work. Um, certainly pre-COVID, I don't know about maybe less so now during COVID, but determines what you wear for huge parts of the day, what you can say, um, you know, who you interact with. Um, I think there's, I mean, I think that point is, is very well or easily made about just how much of one's life work dominates. Yeah, and there are related aspects, uh, like so related technological developments that force you to think about this more. So if you, if people are, even in COVID times, let's say if people are spending more time socially online because of the nature of the online environment, they have to worry about what they say and do more than they probably historically would have and yeah, how it might affect their you know, opportunities for employment, that they're, they're constantly being scrutinized and surveilled for whether they are a fish employee. And if they say something out of line, they might get in trouble for that as well. So that's kind of a related aspect of this. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I suppose now, almost by way of sort of concluding, because you've looked at, um, you know, the case for why a world without work is um, certainly a possible enough to make this a worthy area of discussion and why work is not desirable in many ways. Um, but I just want to go back to something we had already started to touch on. And as I say, as a way of kind of wrapping up this discussion is how do we get there? Um, what, what are the implications for this view about, um, you know, the world currently? So how do you envision, how do we hasten, you know, our march towards a world without work and what consequences does that have? Yeah, well, I mean, so one thing that we do seem to require is um, a policy, again, some kind of income redistribution policy that, that solves the, the effect of, of automation. Uh, I mean, there's different arguments we make here as to whether it has to be an income redistribution policy, because basic income guarantee or negative income tasks is the, the obvious solution to part of this. There's other people who argue for, you know, a basic service guarantee as well as being part of this. Uh, but I think there are reasons to be worried about that in the sense that it, it it kind of ends up with a government or authoritarian structure choosing services for you. Although we have that in many countries anyway, you know, um, where we, we get allocated certain bits of income in order to use certain services. Yes. You know, like there's there are silly examples of this. Again, in, in Ireland, like for example, people get a so-called fuel allowance every year if their income is below a certain threshold. So they get money to buy fuel to survive the winter, yes. you know? So that's kind of allocating them an income for a certain service. I, I tend, to, I guess, instinctually, I'm opposed to those kinds of policies insofar as they seem to constrain Winfans, choice. Which, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I would prefer a kind of a free kind of grant of, of income. Um, in terms of, you know, hastening it, well, this is where we kind of get back into what, what is the correct mix of of policies and, and what's your objective. And so I think an, an awful lot of the policy debate at the moment is really around stopping all the bad things that are happening to work. 
Uh, so if you take the example of the precariousness of employment, there's been a huge movement to advocate for workers' rights for you know, uh, people who are employed by companies like Uber or Deliveroo. I don't, I don't know what the equivalent is in South Africa or whether those companies are also based in, uh, yeah, pretty much in South the Africa. Same, yeah. Okay, Deliveroo, same. Yeah. yeah, so the same kind of organization. So you know, there's been a, some, some success on the front of advocating for workers' rights for those employees. But of course, that, that kind of a will have the effect of maybe slowing down and entrenching, entrenching work you know, taxes on certain kinds of automation uh, may slow down the pace of, of automation. Um, maybe it's a kind of slowdown in, in globalization could also have that effect. I don't know if that's going to happen now. I, I, I would have said, you know, during, uh, given America's kind of outsized influence on the global economy during the Trump era, I, it seemed like there was kind of a retrenchment, uh, this sort of America first policy and, and uh, backlash against globalization that could have slowed down again the the pace of of automation and the impact on our societies that might have prevented that so you if, if you want to hasten these uh the transition to the post-work economy you kind of don't want those policies in place because they they're likely to slow things down but like what i would say as a note of caution is that i'm not necessarily an advocate of like a, a some sort of revolution or radical disruption um, because, you know, if, and in a sense, we, we saw a little bit of this, this is an experiment in this in the past year, is it, if you have a huge percentage of the population that are suddenly unemployed, you have a lot of opportunity for uh, social upheaval and kind of maybe rebelliousness and discontent being sown, which uh, could be very unpleasant. So I'm not, I, I wouldn't be an accelerationist in the kind of classic or the more recent sorry, Marxist sense that where I'm, I welcome a, revo a social revolution in that I think that that could be quite violent and conflictual and w wouldn't necessarily be pleasant to live through. Although that the counter argument of that is I'm just kind of living through, uh, my, or looking at that through my own lens where I have a relatively pleasant lifestyle at, at the moment. So uh, that, I might fear that kind of social disruption more than, than many other people would. Um, so I, I don't know what the kind of ideal mix of policies is. What I would say is that I, I suspect that many of the attempts to slow down the pace of automation will ultimately prove to not work. Can I just go back to our conversation earlier about regulatory efforts to stop yeah. useful forms of automation? They might work in the short term, but in the long term, if the technology is is genuinely beneficial, it'll, it'll find a way out. So to just use one example, if it's the case that automation in medical diagnostics is better than uh, human diagnosis, let's say, uh, I, I think it's very unlikely that society will tolerate having humans um, perform diagnostics if machines are provably better at doing so. And that might, that might also be the case in relation to um, Things like automation of transport, there's more controversy there, but you know, if, if um, autopilot and auto uh, autonomous vehicles are safer than human drivers, provably safer, then it seems very unlikely that um, we'll tolerate people driving their own cars. It'll, it'll come to be seen as kind of a social um, faux pas in the same way that like drink driving is deemed kind of socially unacceptable now. Um, so I suspect a lot of those kind of regulatory proposals will ultimately fail in the in the longer term. Yeah. So as a kind of parting question, as a last um, question, so who, in your opinion, is winning? Well, at least as an idea, um, as an idea in terms of the workforce, who's winning the argument in terms of is a world without work desirable or is a work without work undesirable? What would you say is the mainstream? Um, not just mainstream in the sense of sort of um, pop culture and in the media, but also just within academic and um, sort of the public intelligentsia, um, which, which view would you say is winning the argument? Not necessarily because it's right, it might just have more proponents, so I'm not suggesting the winning view is the right view, I'm just wondering where is the weight of opinion currently? 
So I would say that I am losing the argument in the sense that the, the kind of position that I have in the book about, you know, work not necessarily being a good thing and that we should look towards sort of post-work future, that view doesn't seem to be in the ascendancy at the moment. It very much seems to be the opposite view, which is that work is a good thing. We should try and hold on to it and make it better, more dignified and prevent these intrusions by automation, by technology. Uh, that, that's just my kind of, I haven't done a systematic survey of this, but I'm, I'm sure there are some studies on kind of sentiment towards these things out there, which I should review now that have been conducted in the past couple of years. But again, if you take like these policy developments, let's say around protecting workers and recognizing workers' rights, it seems that I'm on the losing side of the argument at the moment. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for um, giving time to this, despite it being a book you wrote a few years ago. I think it's a topic that still has enormous, um, is of still enormous intellectual interest. So um, I hope that that side does even better, um, because even if you know somebody may not be fully convinced, I, I do think that it's in a scenario planning sense, it's a possible world or scenario that's worth thinking about and deliberating a lot more than we currently do. So. Thanks for writing the book um, and thanks for joining me. All right, and thanks for interviewing me.